Okay, hello everyone. I am going to invite our guest, Stephanie Erb. One moment, please. Okay. <laughs> hello. Hi. Hi. I haven't even seen my hair. Okay. It looks great. Thank it you. It looks great. How are you doing? I'm all right. It's a gloomy day here today in Los Angeles. Yeah, it is. It is a gloomy day, especially like yesterday was like bright and beautiful and sunny. So it was just funny how, how gloomy it ended up being today. But I'm so glad you're here. Uh, nonetheless, thank you so much for being here. Oh, it's my pleasure. Good. Good. Well, I know we've got some people joining. I'm, I'm going to go ahead, uh, Stephanie, and, and just give you a proper intro here as people okay. are joining in. Bear with me one sec here. Okay, so I just want to w just welcome everyone and say, ladies and gentlemen, welcome to Frederick Johnson in Conversation. I am your host, Frederick Johnson. Uh, my guest, Stephanie Erb, is an award-winning actor who began her career in theater. Her first break in television came with a guest starring role on Star Trek The Next Generation mm -hmm. and her film debut in the critically acclaimed movie Fearless. Stephanie has appeared on screen in over 100 film and television roles, including memorable recurring roles on hit series Ray Donovan, 24 Weeds, True Blood, and his work with legendary directors Peter Weir and Paul Verhoeven. Stephanie stars in Ragdoll, one of Hulu's top watch films of 2020, and a role that has garnered her acting awards from both the Chelsea and Golden Door Film Festivals. Stephanie currently appears in two virtual theatrical productions by the Road Theater Company, The Skeleton Flower, and Whiskey and Hooch. And we're going to talk about everything. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Stephanie Herb. Hi. <laughs> so, Stephanie, you're, you're originally from Cleveland, Ohio. Uh, well, I kind of grew up all over the United okay. States because my father was a musician and a college professor. Okay. Professor, so, but I had a lot of time I spent in Cleveland growing up. Um, we moved back and forth and back and forth. So. Okay. Okay. So a lot of times, well, I I had read. So I I read you'd spent some time in Cle you know Cleveland in your childhood, and also too that your first acting inspiration came from. You were eight years old, and you'd yeah. watch Laurence Olivier perform Hamlet on PBS. So mm -hmm. what about that performance made such an impression on you at eight years old? Well, I just remember it was after school, and I turned it on. It was black and white, which was not happening when I was a little kid. So I was like, this was cool. And then I just got sucked into how good the acting was. And um, although I probably didn't understand what was happening some of the time. Yeah. A lot of it was really clear and it was just so elevated and beautiful. And uh, Laurence Olivier was so amazing. And I thought, how does he do that? How mm -hmm. does he make this elevated language just sound like someone talking to himself and that sort of thing. And I, I was fascinated and I never forgot it. I mm -hmm. never forgot it. Even, you know, I was a pre-med I have a degree in biology. I was gonna be a doctor for sure. My teachers would all say, she's so smart, she should be a doctor or a lawyer. But in my head, I was like, no, I wanna do what that guy did. That you remembered, <laughs> even then you were still remembering oh, the yeah. impression Lawrence Olivier made. Yes, yes, so now definitely. You, you did go on to the Acclaim Theater School at uh, Southwestern, or Southern, I'm sorry, Southern yep. Methodist University. Yep, yep. And I actually then, got a degree in English and biology there first. Wow, okay. But because I was still going to be a doctor, and then okay. um, something inside me went, I don't really want to do this. I don't know. Um, you know, I just, I, I, I made a vow. I said, if I audition for this acclaimed theater department and I get in, that is a sign <laughs> that I should be an actor, and I got in. So I finished the other degrees, but I took an overload kind of many semesters of too mm -hmm. many hours so that I could do the theater degree as well. So you went to, now did you go to New York after school? After you, yes. So you yes. left Dallas, you go to New York, mm -hmm. which is, I mean, that's a big deal. I mean, were, was, were you nervous about that move? Were you just ready to take New York by storm? Like how did that all come to be? Well, the interesting thing is that, um, 
my uh, school used to have a program where they took the undergrads and the grads and they cut people ruthlessly after every semester. Okay. So you, you might not make it through the whole program. I made it through the whole program and it used to be a promise that you would get a showcase in New York if you made it through the whole program. They stopped that the year I graduated. Right. So I had no intro to an agent or anything in New York. I was basically going there blind, trying to find a roommate. They, the cost of living there was crazy. And I had to find jobs. I mean, it was extremely terrifying. And I really would sit in my, you know, yucky apartments going, how am I going to get this career started? I wasn't really no, sure how I what was going to do What it, was you your know? first job when you got to New York? Like when you just landed and had to make a living? Well, I mean, my on my first like r normal job, yeah. normal, I think I, the, I did so many jobs. Everything from proofreading to being a personal assistant. But the one that kind of stuck was being a nanny okay. because I really love kids. And uh, it's a more active job. I really didn't do very well in college. I had some office-y jobs in the summer, and I did not enjoy that process okay. at all. Um, so I ended up being a nanny in New York a fair amount. And indeed, when I moved to L.A., I was a nanny for some celebrities as well, which okay. is not a job I would recommend for anyone. Okay. <laughs> but eventually you got into theater and what yes. now how did that how did you get into theater in New York at that time okay well the cool thing about New York at the time I don't even know if it's like this anymore is that you could trot your picture around to agents and go would you submit me to you know theater gigs that are appropriate it was called hip pocketing you didn't have to sign a contract and if they kind of liked your training or what you look like they would throw your picture at some jobs so um, that basically is what happened. I, my first equity job was playing Shelby in Steel Magnolias. Oh, wow. Okay. At, at the Cincinnati Playhouse in the park. So, you know, you end up going to all the regional theaters and working yes. all over the place. You never can save any money, <laughs> you know, but you get paid, you get two months of work with, you make new friends, you do some great yes. stuff. Then you go back to New York and start all over again. And you did, you did a lot of regional theater and yes. I, and, I, and you did, you also did a national tour as well with John Hausman's uh, acting company, which Correct. is the legend John Hausman. Did you have an opportunity, was he still alive then? Did you have No, an he wasn't okay. alive, but you know, the reputation of the group, cause yes. Ke you know, uh, Kevin Klein, started there patty lapone started there so yeah. it was a job everybody wanted and um for me it was just blind luck i had i actually had been robbed my apartment had been <laughs> robbed in new york and they took most of my stuff no and so and i had just auditioned for this tour and i had thought i'm tired of being broke new york is really hard maybe i'll move to la and try film and tv because there wasn't a lot of film and tv in new york at the time just right. soaps pretty much um so i got robbed and then i remember like the next two days later i got a call saying you booked the job for the national tour and i was like great because i don't have any stuff to bring with me anymore <laughs> you know it was primarily like a, it's the super convenient job and because yeah. they paid well you could save money to move, which is really my goal was to get yes. to LA. So yes. it was so a great did experience. Use that, did you use that national tour as a way to, to get to Los Angeles? Only financially. I mean, right. the, it's a great job because especially if you're young, you're on a bus, you're on planes, you're all over the United States, little teeny towns that never get to see a play. And they're so grateful that you're there doing Shakespeare or big old cities. Um, the way they had this particular tour set up, we did uh, autumn in the the Northeast, so we got to see all the color. It was really just yeah. a lovely, lovely experience. Very talented actors. Some of them are famous now. Um, and uh, But also, if you play your cards right, you can save money. And that's what I did. I saved money so that I could move my stuff, get a car, you know, and go to L.A. And that's what I did. And then I spent a lot of time nannying there when I first got there. So, so you get to LA and uh -huh. your your first break in TV, your first guest starring role 
with Star Trek, the next generation. And I know I also heard you're a Trekkie. So I yeah, have, I mean, so... okay, before I left New York, I took this class about, you know, making your dreams come true as an actor. And yeah. um, the teacher uh, had us make a list of our dream jobs, ones we thought we could never in a million years get. And at this point, I was a regional theater actress who was struggling to, like, eat more than a bagel and a yogurt in a day, you know. Right. So on my list were... Uh, do a Star Trek episode because I was a Trekkie growing up. I watched the old school Trekkies reruns and I used to audio record them and memorize the lines because yeah. I am a nerd. I am a nerd. Yeah. Um, so doing a Star Trek episode was one. Working with Peter Weir was one on my list. Oh, really? Um, yeah, I had others. They still have yet to happen, but you know, okay. time is still on my side, I think. Uh, so when I got to LA, I just kind of went, I'll write letters to the casting director of Star Trek. You know, I didn't know what I was doing, which is a great asset, I think, sometimes. Yes, yes. Because you do, you know, bold things and make things happen. So he started calling me in, and then I booked uh, the Man of the People episode of Next Generation. Wow. wow. Yeah. And it all started with that manifestation list back in New York. Yeah, and, then and I the remember... <laughs> yeah, I was, and then, and, right. And then the Peter Weir came true as well because your your feature film debut. And I mean, Peter Weir directed the Truman Show and yes. uh, Witness, Dead Poets Society. Dead Poets Society. I mean, Ooh. just le legendary directors. So you your so what was that? So this is your first feature. So what was he like? What was Peter Weir like? And then what was the experience like? This being your first movie. Well, first of all, the process to get cast in it is a very long story. I don't know if you have time for that, but um, it was mainly me doing the same thing, reaching out as a dum-dum who doesn't know anything and going, hi, I wanna do movies. And then for some reason, everything rolled out fortuitously that I ended up meeting him at a callback. Uh, and I got the, I read for three parts originally and I got the part I wanted. And he's an amazing artist of a person. Mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. Just really interested in what other people think and have to say. Also really in the process of making a movie. He doesn't know what it means at the beginning. He's figuring it out as he goes. It's like a, you know, a, an artistic puzzle for him. Okay. And um, I remember being in our hotel in Bakersfield and he would strolled by. And he, some of us actors were sitting around outside by a fire pit or something. And he was like, what do you think this movie means? <laughs> and we're like, you're asking us, lowly actors, you know? Um, yeah. He was just a real humanitarian. He was uh, extremely gifted at setting the tone for the plane crash scenes, which were really sad and yeah. scary and horrible. But he would tell us these really, um, gut-wrenching stories about people who have survived plane crashes and then we would shoot something and uh, I mean the really more difficult thing about the airplane stuff is you have all these actors who are all supposed to be having different experiences of maybe facing their own demise you know mm -hmm. and I think mm -hmm. he really achieved that if you look back at those scenes yes yes definitely definitely yeah. he's incredible um Next, next director I want to talk about is Paul Verhoeven, who, who I, I have to imagine, I've never met him, but I have to imagine is a fascinating man. I mean, he, Basic Instinct, uh, Sh Showgirls, uh, Total Recall, Black Book. I love, Black Book's one of my favorite movies. And of course, the film that you did with him, Starship Troopers. So mm -hmm. what, what, same question, what was, what was Paul Verhoeven like? Well, you know, I really didn't interact with him as much because okay. my scene was a lot of people. There were mechanical cockroaches. <laughs> there were live cockroaches. Um, they were way over budget by the time they had been shooting, you know, my the stuff I was in. So I really had very little interaction with him. He had to uh, okay my wardrobe at one point, okay. but it was more or less action and a lot of improv too. I mean, okay. I believe that my audition was primarily improv okay. as well. So, you know, I can't really tell you a lot of specifics about him is that he, he's certainly a character. Yeah, I would imagine. Yeah. I would imagine. On, on the TV side, 
I know you did a project with James Burroughs, who is, you know, the creator of Cheers and one of the most acclaimed directors and, and you know, creators in, in television specifically and comedy. What was it like working with James Burroughs? Well, I think the most interesting thing about him is that he doesn't like when I observed him, he would be listening to the comedy, not looking at it. And I thought that is so telling mm -hmm. because I feel like comedy is very much about rhythm and pitch and that sort of thing. So that was the big take home for me from watching him work. Also, he kept calling me Stacy, but I think <laughs> that was because he was teasing me. I hope he didn't think my name was Stacy, but you know, you never know. Um, but yeah, I think it was more that he was, he was listening to the comedy rather than looking at yeah. it. And then you and then you did the horror film classic The Ring, which was which was an adaptation of the the Japanese classic with Gore Verbinski, who's also yeah. you know known for the whole Pirates of the Caribbean yes. franchise. I mean, that was a huge. Now, what was that like? Kind of as uh, was that was a different genre and yeah. Uh, yeah, I really you know I really dug him. He was I, I we would shoot in the morning and he'd be smoking a cigar. You know, I just and he was really. He'd come in on the set and say, try this, do this, do this. It was very collaborative. And I really just think he's an incredibly smart guy and a really funny guy. Uh, I had no idea who Naomi Watts was at the time. It was like, I don't know what her big breakout was, but it was right around when she was starting okay. to be known. So I was like, I don't know who that is. But I really liked the part because I was supposed to be a techie and I hadn't had a role like that. And I... Yeah. We, we sort of made her a, a lesbian and really grungy, and I just really enjoy disappearing into a character kind of like yes. that. And um, it's amongst my favorite things that I've done. Well, I loved the, the recurring role you had on Ray Donovan. I've, I have a question <laughs> about that. I love that character. As, yeah. as well, Helen. I think the character's name was Helen. Yeah, and Helen there was Miller. A scene, Helen Miller. I wanted to ask you about because there's a scene where you get bitten by a snake in an airport hangar, and I yeah. wanted. To, and it's a whole thing. It's a whole kind of com comedic, absurd kind of a scene. But I wanted to ask you: Was that like a real snake? Like, how was it a real snake? How did there that were happen? real snakes involved, okay. but they did not get close to me. You know, and I think there were like fake snakes. But I can't even remember, to tell you the truth. I mean, that the day we shot that, they also just sprung on me that we're going to have you punched in the face, too. And I'm <laughs> like, OK. And they were like looking all, and, and I'm so game. I was just happy to be employed. Yeah. Um, and I felt like Liev Schreiber and I had a good rapport. After, you know, at first, when you show up on a set and you're not a series regular, it's really like the first day of school and you yeah. don't know who's going to be nice to you or who's going to learn your name. And at first I felt like, oh boy, I don't know if this is going to be a fun job. But then it became that Leah was really, he, once he, he found out how I, I worked in New York, then he was like, oh, you're cool. <laughs> I don't know what that had to do with anything, but. Um, that, that was like street cred for him or something. Yeah. I yeah. mean, I, cause he comes from theater in New York yeah. too. And, and actually, uh, I brought up one of his performances at New York Shakespeare Festival, and I think he was impressed that I even knew about that because it's probably not something that pops up in conversation with him. So, uh, so yeah, the punching, they had to go look for a fight coordinator. It was like, yeah. okay, it punching, was a, this, snake yeah. bite, I'm <laughs> good for it. Well, let's, you know, then we well, have had to pick me up from yeah. the floor. Yeah. You know, I am not a tiny woman. I am not yeah. four foot 11, I'm yeah. five foot seven. I was like, I hope he's been working out because that's not yeah. going to be easy. Well, he did the way it. that it was shot, it's like you're you're getting like I mean, literally punched in the face and you fall on the ground and it, and I didn't even know if there was really a stunt double or if you just did that stunt yourself. Like me, okay, okay, I did it, and I was really worried it wouldn't look real because you yeah. know she wasn't really allowed to get too close to my face. It looked but, real. Yeah, but and, there's and, so much yeah. you can do with cameras with yeah. angles and things. So. Yeah. It, it looked great. real and the punch sound effect, like, you know, of course, you know, it, it gave it, it gave it what it needed to be convincing. Yeah. Uh, I, I want to talk about uh, Ragdoll, which is, is such a great film. And anyone who's watching that hasn't seen it yet, um, please go on Hulu. It's one of the top watch films of this past year on Hulu. It's a great movie. Um, so, uh, this film, just to kind of give a little bit of the premise, it's, it's, it's a story about a young woman 
um, who I feel like she's kind of in a life circumstance where the odds are totally stacked against her. You know, everything that could be hard about her life is hard um, as she's pursuing a dream of being, uh, you know, professional mixed martial arts artist. And mm -hmm. uh, one of the challenges is that she's taking care of her mother who is dying with stage four cancer, played by you, Catherine. Um, so what was the experience like with that film? Where did you guys shoot? And then how did you prepare to play someone dying of cancer throughout an entire film? Well, I was incredibly worried that I wasn't skinny enough when I got cast. I was like, oh, God, I because yeah, I like food. Okay. <laughs> you know, I went to your house to get some cake. You know, I like food. Um, but, uh, but the director assured me you could do it just by wearing baggy clothes. And I love the director, Bailey, who is, I think, a visionary. And I'm, you know, I'm trusting that his career is going, he's going to get keep going and going and making you, stuff. You are doing another film with Yeah, with I did another film with him. Uh, okay. It's not done shooting because of COVID, of course. Um, he's having to sort of cut and paste bits together. But yes. um, it's called God is an Astronaut. It's uh, based on a Oprah Winfrey book list book. And uh, it's a really beautiful piece. And when he asked me if I'd be interested in playing whatever, and I was like, oh, yes, <laughs> I do. Yeah. Um, because he's he's he really he's kind of a little visionary guy, and uh, I didn't even have to audition for Catherine. He just looked at my reel and he went, "That's it. That's what I want." And I don't have a lot of roles like that on my reel up until that point. So I was like, "Really? You don't want me to read some scenes?" And he was like, "Nope." Um, and the girl whose mother I play, we looked enough alike that mm -hmm. it kind of worked really well. And Turns out she and I probably are related in some kind of way because her last name is Murray and my grandma's last name is Murray. So who knows? There, know? There's some connection down the line somewhere. I believe so. Yeah. But it, we shot it uh, north of L.A. in a little cheap Airbnb freaky little, you know, but it was shot all over the place because yeah. there are, you know boxing scenes and yes he had to cut and paste like you do with any low budget uh film yeah it just so happens that it's a low budget film that's i think really good and people are responding to it it's really good and i mean this was a film festival favorite i know this this yep. film went on to win you know nearly two dozen awards at yep. film festivals all over the country so what did you so when you knew Catherine stage four cancer in the entire film she's in the you know she's preparing for herself to die so i mean what as was there some particular research you did for that part or how did you get into that process? well i mean i i have been around people who have cancer um my father had you know uh dementia which is a wasting disease um so i think my primary concern was that the energy levels be appropriate and i don't want to give away the movie but right. it is shot out of order so that was the hardest part is knowing what part of her trajectory i was in at any given point and thank goodness the director was also keeping track of that because yeah sometimes i wasn't sure if i was about to die or what was happening you know um but really for me it's about her spirit her life spirit more than her death it's like she's mad because she doesn't want to go she loves her kid and she hates that her kid has to work so hard to keep them afloat um and it's all the different threads going in her character that made her interesting yeah. she's funny she's horrible yeah <laughs> she's lovable and yeah. she's a mom like a mom a fierce mom and yes. she's a snarky uh drunk you know, it yeah. had so many levels. I was yes. so, I was so pleased to be cast because you know, a lot of TV supporting roles and guest stars just don't offer that, and it's really yes. what I came out here to do is play three dimensional characters as best yeah. I can. Well, this this was a great part, definitely multi dimensional, and and it really and it's about. I mean, it's about class. It's about poverty. It's about. Mm -hmm. You know, and, and it's got a great message. It's, uh, you know, it's uplifting. There is a twist in the end. I'm not going to say anymore. I'm not going to give anything away because I want everyone to to watch the film and support the film. You know, I, I wanted... think the interesting thing is people think it's a boxing movie, but yeah. it isn't. It's, yeah. It is, 
So if you like yeah. boxing, you'll dig it because they're yes. doing Shannon training. They're doing yeah. real boxing stuff. Yes. But it's also about all sorts of things and yes. life as a as a whole piece. You know, we yes. can all relate to something in this movie. Absolutely. Yeah, for sure. For sure. And I so along with that film, which is which is now streaming on Hulu, um, the two plays, I want to talk about the Road Theater Company, which is out here uh -huh. in North Hollywood, California, and, and what we all call out here the NoHo Arts District. Mm -hmm. um, having been so accomplished in theater, I wanted to ask you how you landed on joining Road Theater, because I know you've been a member at that theater company since 2013. Mm -hmm. In 2018, you did a production there where you won a Cine Award mm -hmm. and were no nominated for an Ovation Award for your role in a play called uh, Through the Eye of the Needle. Yeah. So I wanted to ask you, coming to LA, having had all that theater background and then having all of you know the film and TV credit in your career, what was it about that theater company that you said, okay, you know what, I'm gonna be, I'm gonna get involved with this theater company? Well, really, it was the people. You know, well, there are a lot of theater companies in this town, and I belong to many of them. Um, a lot of times, it involves a lot of legwork. You have to sell candy. You have to, you know, you have to. There's no money in theater in L.A. unless you're at, you know, maybe the Geffen or the Mark Taper. So if you're going to be in a theater company, most of the time you have to work. And sometimes, some parts of my life, I wasn't able to work as much as I might have needed to or want to work. Um, but The Road has a lot of really lovely actors, really great people. Um, that particular play that you mentioned that I, was a wonderful experience where we all felt like a family. I think that's what you miss from theater when you stop doing it, is you get to really delve into stuff with a bunch of people. And it's not like showing up on a set and do this, this, and this, and hold your clipboard and then cry and then leave, you know? Yeah. You don't get to make a lasting imprint on any people most of the time. I assume if you're a series regular or you're Denzel Washington or something, you do. But not when you're doing what I've been doing for 25 years. So theater really fills that need of having a family, an artistic family. Um, the stuff that I've done online this year for The Road, I'm just really proud of because we're trying to keep theater alive even though there's no theater. So yeah. there's Zoom theater, not everybody yes. loves it. I personally don't, you know, I'm not someone who thrives on it, let us say, but I make do and I do the best I can. Yeah. And um, The Road does mostly unproduced plays. They're all new. They're mm -hmm. premieres in LA, they're West Coast premieres, they're international premiere sometimes so there are new works that are destined for success or maybe not but it's interesting to be part of that process um, so one of the productions so there are two there are mm -hmm. two there's a, you're, there's a drama mm -hmm. um that people can it's current streaming now called the mm -hmm. skeleton flower and then there's a comedy called whiskey and hooch that's also streaming now which everyone who's watching in in the post when i post this this uh this interview, all of the links will be there. So you'll know how to get to those productions. But uh -huh. I want it. So the skeleton flower, which is a drama. Um, I, I it's a beautiful story. And I want to ask you kind of first more the technical question, because it's a zoo, it's, it's a zoom production. Yeah. But I, I have to tell you, in part part, and it's a two hour play. So this is a two hour play, it's got like three acts to it. Mm -hmm. um, so it's I found myself forgetting that I was watching it on Zoom. Like that's oh, how, good. yeah, that that's means... how kind of pulled into the story I was. But I was curious when I was watching it from a technical point of view, how does that work? Are you literally kind of acting opposite the people on Zoom or are you just kind of taping your part? Like how did the technical Oh work? no, it's all live on Zoom and we, you know, turn off our cameras when we're not in a scene. I th uh, the biggest drawback to Zoom is if you're, doing a reading, which these were not, you know, you're not off book. You have to look at your lines and then look at the person you're acting with and you kind of have to split the difference or get off book if you can, but I don't think any of us did. Um, and, you know, you can't touch the other person. You can't hug them. You can't kiss them. You know, you have to just really use your imagination to the best of your abilities. And I'm so glad that you, you know, got lost in it because yeah. I worry about that. I worry that the physical presence of actors in front of you is missing. 
Well, I think the story was so compelling and it, yeah. it's so well told and the characters are great. You, you tell us a little bit, you know, about what, what the play is about. Well, uh, it was written by Elizabeth Sampson and it is a play about two sisters who don't get along very well, but their mother is dying of cancer. You know, another mom dying of cancer. I don't want that to be like a theme anymore. Um, <laughs> but, you know, there's a ton of humor in it because it's about these two women grappling with their place in life. Yeah. Both of them are being discarded by their husbands or have been and how they go to find love and how they um, come to terms with their mom um, not doing so well and their own relationship kind of being terrible. Yes. And, uh, you know, the, much to Elizabeth's credit, there's a ton of humor in it. Yes. And it's very heartfelt at the same time and explores you know, the middle-aged woman and what happens to them in our society and, and a ton of other things, you know. Yes, yes. Well, no, I thought I thought it was wonderful. Um, and yeah, you guys did a great job. And it was just interesting to see a full, you know, kind of multi-act play being played out. Um, and just, well, you talked about this a little bit, but just going back now to like the process, the mm -hmm. fact that you're used to acting opposite people, like in person, you know, mm -hmm. on a stage. Um, how did you, because there's a lot of serious moments in this play. I mean, there's, you know, the, the mother dying. I mean, there's a, many moments. Like, did you have to kind of prepare as an actor for that a little bit differently you know, or just the same preparation? I think, um, look, I've been doing this a long time. So a lot of what young me would have done as preparation is kind of just there now. You know, I, I'll take in words and see where I go. I try not to plan ahead and I try to have fun and I try to, you know, let go any expectation of needing to cry or anything. If it's there, it's there. If it's not there, it's not there. I mean, my, my role in Through the Eye of the Needle had my character crying, I think, every six pages. And I just told the director, I was like, I don't think it's going to be there, but we'll find something cool, you know, mm -hmm, because mm -hmm. it just it didn't work for where I was going in the character in this particular circumstance. And also because Gwen, who was playing my mother is so adorable. And I know her as a company member, it was really easy to get choked up and, and, and completely devastated by watching her go, you know? So uh, it's a combination of having your own system, your own acting system in place and working with other people at this point. Also, the the with whiskey and hooch, which is a comedy. Yes, uh, it's like the to I mean, it couldn't be further away. I know. From, I love uh, that about it. <laughs> yeah, the skeleton flower, and uh, it's it's very and it's a farce. I mean, that's kind of how that's I thought it. about it. It's a farce, uh, and technically, with that production, as people see, I thought it was interesting. You guys did do some cool things where when one character is handing the character something else, even though yeah. it's on Zoom, it's, you get the sense that the person reached out their arm and they pulled something from the frame that the other person handed. You know, there was, there, they, they, basically there was different types of direction and how yeah. Zoom was used and how that, that piece was produced. Yeah, I think all Zoom theater right now, we're all coming up with tricks. Yeah. Tricks to make it work for us and for you guys who are watching, yeah. so. I don't think we invented that, <laughs> passing yeah, props yeah. and things, but yeah. it does help. And it also is amusing, I think. If yeah. you're reaching out and somebody is like getting it back, even though everyone knows we're in our own little cubby holes, um, I think it's really fun. And uh, the playwright there, uh, Carlos La Camera, he had other ideas about when they're beating each other up and yeah. stuff like that. And it really works, I think. Yeah, um, I thought it worked. And I think I, we all need to laugh a lot. So yes. I, I recommend yeah. everyone to go see Whiskey and Hooch. And, yes. and I guess you will be putting the links I will down put, there. I'll put the link for that as well. And so both of these pieces have come out, you know, along with some other pieces that the, that the Road Theater has put out um, virtually during this quarantine time. And I wanted to ask you what, when this shutdown happened, you know, you were in the, you were in the middle of making a film at that time, and I'm sure I had other other things going on and on, you know, coming up. 
What has this experience been like for as a working actor and maybe for other working actors, you know, that literally just production just halted, you know, what is, what have, what is this quarantine experience? Well, been? I think uh, it's been devastating, first of all, and also in the middle of it, our, our union changed our quotas for health insurance and made them higher when nobody's working. So we were like, oh, take someone who's down and punch him in the head kind of thing. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it has forced us all to get equipment because now we have to do our auditions from home. We need lighting like I have here. We need, uh, you know, some people have microphones, some people have backdrops. Uh, so it's been, you know, cost outflow for actors everywhere. And then you really don't get what I love, which is the interpersonal connection with casting people, with production people, with the director. This is not there. So you may think you did a beautiful audition or a really funny audition for something, send it out by WeTransfer, whatever it is they are asking you to do, and you hear nothing. And I think mm. it's um, really disheartening because yeah. we thrive on in, you know, communicating. And this yeah. is much less, this is about being in a bubble and hoping someone digs what you do. Yeah. And you know, most of us, if I send an audition where I'm too funny and they want me to be more deadpan, they'll go, can you tone it down a little bit? And I can, of course. But now there's no opportunity to be directed in the room. Because you're just sending whatever it is via WeTransfer and if you hear something, into right. Yeah, so you're ostensibly guessing what they want, what they want the look to be, all of that. And then you just sit and wait. And I have to say, you know, I'm not the only person who has found it pretty disheartening. Some people are working, some productions are still moving along. I mean, they went on hiatus for a little while, they come back, there are auditions for things, but um, it's just, it's very difficult. It's very, yeah. you know, I just, I'm sure every profession is having, except, unless you work online, usually is having their, you know, pain and frustration. Yeah. And we are definitely part of that group for sure. Yes. Well, you have done some creating of your own. There's a, a couple of projects I want to talk about that you, uh -huh. you, you created, co-created, co-written, co-directed. Um, one of them I love is called Therapy with Pammy, which I, I think you launched like kind of right before this this whole pandemic shutdown. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to read the tagline, and then I and then I want you to talk about how this this uh, project came together. It's it's a 16 episode series um and the tagline is after her seventh divorce beverly hills influencer slash entrepreneur slash socialite pammy seeks sliding scale therapy with the unflappable dr l together they work to peel back the layers of delusion dysfunction and lip fillers to help pammy become her best self so this this show is hilarious um and your your co-creator and and in and, and partner in crime there caitlin hugh mm -hmm. so how did this project come together therapy with pammy well you know i think uh, starting about three or four years ago i started going i really want to make things because a i've been doing this long enough that i feel like i'm right i was writing before i even you know came out here so it's not something that i'm not used to doing but I thought I could produce and direct and I wanted to try because partly once you hit a certain age in Hollywood, you're not given a lot of choice in the roles you get to read for. And there are still so many things I was dying to do. Um, so my first project was a pilot called Viv and Keeks. And we shot that and it's in, you know, the sizzle reels in the can and I'm just trying to find a home for it. And then backstage during Through the Eye of the Needle, Caitlin Huey, who plays Pammy, would do this character where she would manipulate her face so it looked like she had lip fillers. And I would take a hairbrush and ask her questions. And it would make everybody laugh backstage. And we would record some and some we would put on Instagram and people were like, this is hilarious. What is this? And so after the show was over, I said, you know, Caitlin, we should just do this. We should just make a show. And I, you know, came up with the idea of making it therapy yeah. because she obviously needed a lot of it. Yeah. And then we decided to just shoot it with, you know, we got the friends and family discount from camera people and the director and we just did it. And right around when the pandemic hit is when we started rolling them out. 
and people really liked it. We got, yeah. I don't know, a hundred thousand views like within the first couple months and uh, Yahoo Entertainment said it was what to watch in quarantine along with yeah. that Tiger King guy. <laughs> um, but, you know, we had a great time shooting it. Yeah. We will shoot more, I hope, when COVID is over. I yeah. spun it out into a new show called In Therapy with Dr. L. Okay. And I have new patients, including a an animated roll of toilet paper, who is okay. who is a TikTok star, Toily T Paper, has 20 million views on TikTok. Okay. Um, and then my newest patient is eBuzz Hanky, who uh, Dr. L is pretty sure was a porn star at one point. But, you know, I'm just going to keep finding <laughs> actors who have cool characters they can bring to me. And, yeah. and eventually, Pammy will be back from the COVID spa she's yeah. attending right nice. now. Nice, nice. Well, there's another project, too, in, in this in this past year you that you co-created as well. Um, yeah. Uh, called Short Smirks, which mm -hmm. is very like quirky comedy shorts. Like, how would you? I, I, how, why would you I would just say, call it, yeah. you know, like along the lines of French and Saunders, the British show. Yes. Those two women who who basically just did a bunch of sketches. You know, yes. like like the olden times where there was a sketch show. That's yes. kind of what we were envisioning. We wanted it to be female centric. We wanted it to be very quirky, a little sciency, because most yeah. of our the episodes we've done so far have to do with time leaps or ghosts or yeah. I was you know, say there's like a like paranormal. That. There's kind of yeah. like a paranormal theme in there. One of the episodes called the uh, I think the gratitude jar. Um, gratitude jar time capsule. The gratitude jar time capsule yeah. won an award at yeah. the Atlanta Comedy Film Festival. Yes, we won uh, just... best comedy pilot of twenty twenty. Yes, so congratulations. Cool. Congratulations. No, it's great. And that's and that's what I was I it's a perfect description of it that it is kind of you guys could take this to so many different places because it is like a sketch comedy show. There are different episodes, different vignettes, and that's a, and how did you all come together to collaborate on this project? Well, and ironically, we shot all of those the weekend before the shutdown. We oh, got we okay. squeaked it under the wire. Um I, you know, I've known Deb for a long time, and she and I would go out for pancakes and go, we got to make stuff. Because she, like like me and like so many, are like, I want to do more roles, more things, more funny stuff, you know. And so we just sort of made a vow to get it done. And, you mm -hmm. know, it took a while because you have to do, as a union member, you have to do a SAG contract. That's a lot of work. And it costs money. So we had yeah. to use our own funds to hire our team and Ben Sollenberger, who was our line producer, was amazing. Um, and we're definitely, you know, we have so many ideas to do more of them, but it's just impossible to get people to do it. Uh, COVID's very expensive, too, because you have to have a yeah. COVID compliance officer. You have to have all the things in place to protect everyone. So we shall hope that this goes away sometime soon so we can yes. play again, because we really had a great time. Yeah. And we really love the results that came out of it you it's know. great i'm gonna i'm gonna post the link to that youtube page as well so people can see the three episodes of, okay. of short smirks on there a great. couple of i want to talk about a couple of more things stephanie before before we um have to start wrapping up at okay. like our end of our hour i know that um you had a part in the new Denzel Washington movie that just actually premiered two days ago. Yep. Uh, the called the Little Things. It's mm -hmm. a, it's like a cop thriller starring Denzel Washington, Rami Malek, Ro and uh, Jared Leto. Mm -hmm. And I know you had a part in that. And as things often go, you know, <laughs> scenes get cut, directors do things, things don't end up in the final cut, etc. So I wanted to ask you, you know, a about that particular uh, film, which I yeah. know role that the scenes ended up getting cut but then just kind of the overall issue as an actor of is there a sense that when you do anything are you at the mercy of the editor oh yes okay <laughs> i mean i feel like i made the mistake of telling my mom and telling a bunch of people on facebook that i was in this movie and i had a couple really you know one scene in particular was really touching and had levels because i play the mom of a girl who's been murdered um and 
you never know. You never know what's going to happen. And you forget. You get excited. Uh, and, you know, apparently they, I don't know why we got our bits cut out of there. You still see me. I'm still lurking there. But the whole actual scene with the parents in the girl's bedroom is completely gone. And I, I had to have a little weepy time. You know, I had a little cry because, you know, being in a movie with Denzel is a huge deal. And I wanted it to be something where I was there intact doing my work, but you know, it was not meant to be for whatever reason. So, so you go, wow, showbiz is hard. Why do I do this? Ouch, <laughs> wham, boo. And then you pick yourself up and go on to the next. You know, yeah. I think if it weren't for COVID, I probably would have taken it in more stride, but there's yeah. not as many job opportunities. So yeah. I was really looking forward to having a little something something out there for people to look at that was yes. such a major production yes. um, but it was not meant to be i mean i'm there i've gotten some very lovely people saying your presence is felt there and that's great but you know it isn't what i did yeah and, and you know maybe someday i'll get to see that footage i don't know no i no i saw some footage stephanie i saw some footage of you doing stand-up comedy <laughs> Okay, yeah. At at a very, very well known popular stand up club out mm -hmm. here in the San Fernando Valley called Flappers. Mm -hmm. Um and I have to say, you were good. You were good. And I I'm and a I funny wanted person. to I mean had you you are funny, but like had you done stand up before? Was that a because you seemed incredibly comfortable doing your it was like your you had like ten minutes, five to ten minutes of material and you uh -huh. just did a stand up set at Flappers and I was I was impressed. Well, the one thing I decided, you know, when your career is not bustling, you must keep being creative, or at least I need to. Some people are good going, you know what, I'm just going to knit for a while and we'll see what happens. But I'm always like, I got to do things. And I had to always, I really respect stand-ups. Like Maria Bamford is one of my favorite people to watch, women in particular, because it is not a lady's world. It is very much a man business. Um, so I took some classes and I just wanted to challenge myself to try it partly because it scared me to death, yeah. you know, because you really, you're just there. Sometimes you're there making fun of yourself and hoping people don't feel. You know? um, so uh, I, it is very much a boy world. So women who do stand up, my, my respect for them is huge. Like Karen Rontowski is like someone I, I just love her because she doesn't care and she just does her thing and she's hilarious. Um, and you know, there's a myth that women aren't funny, but they really mm -hmm. are funny. And the most interesting thing was you, what? Uh oh, are we being no. turned off? Oh, okay. Oh, did we, um, did we have a connection issue? Are oh, we no, good? you stopped for a second, you froze, but you're oh. back. Anyway, um, okay. someone okay. asked me the to The internet, do... the internet. That's... Yes. Someone asked me to do uh, a stand-up in a character, like for a sci-fi convention type thing. Yeah. And I played Spock's girlfriend. And I think I had the most fun doing stand-up as Spock's girlfriend because I didn't have to be me. Yeah. I was just Spock's girlfriend. <laughs> yes. Yes. Well, I thought I thought you did a great job. It was it was a pleasant surprise to see and and to find out that because I mean just the idea. I have a I have a cousin who is a professional stand-up comedian. And, you know, I, I just, every time I've gone to see her perform, I feel nervous before she's coming out on stage because it's just a huge thing going out there. And, you know, you're trying to be like, I think it's different than if you were doing a monologue. It's different if you were singing. I mean, because the goal is to make people laugh. You know, are they going to laugh? So you just don't know until you're actually in the moment doing it. So exactly, and you, yeah. you know, I I would get booked in a night that was just all men, and my jokes were about you know very girly things sometimes, and I'd yeah. be like, they're gonna hate me, you know. But sometimes <laughs> they would, and you just yeah. have to go, oh well, that hurt. But, yeah, you know, onward we go, and well, other times I'd be surprised. Yeah. Well, Stephanie, thank you so much for coming and spending this time. Uh, is there anything like coming up or working on out or, you know, that, that you want to make sure we know about or touch on um, before we go? 
Well, as I mentioned, there's not a lot going on because of right. COVID. So really, I would love it if people would follow In Therapy with Dr. L on YouTube okay. or, you know, go to my website. All my info is there, like yeah. me on IMDb. And it, yeah. You know, it's so funny because social media has become a huge part of an actor's value. Yes. That did not exist when I got out here. Right. And it's, it's, it's a learning curve that changes rapidly. So come follow me. I like to talk to people. I don't do private messages so much because some weirdos show up there, but right, right. <laughs> but I'll right. talk to you on my walls and various places for sure. Well, Stephanie, we're going to do, we're going to post all of those links. So people will know I'm going to post the links about the film Ragdoll, about the Roadhouse Theater Productions. And we'll also put the therapy with Dr. L and short smirks and therapy with uh, Pam, therapy with Pammy. Yeah, uh, we're in well. therapy with Dr. Eller, the new one. In therapy with Dr. Eller, the new if, one. If you need more, there's more. If there. you need more. No, we'll get them all in there. We'll get them yeah. all in there. But Stephanie, thank you so much. And I'm wishing you all the best in 2021. And I'm looking forward to production coming back full force uh, too, and, and seeing you out there and seeing you some new projects. And then the projects you're working on, having those um, coming out as well and getting back into doing your own stuff that you're co-creating and directing and writing too. So well, thank you so much for having this. me. This right, was thank fun. You. Thank you. All right. And thank you guys for joining us. Um, let's everybody thank Stephanie for such a wonderful guest. It's been a great episode and I will see you next time in conversation. Goodbye, everybody. <laughs>